Mr. Leichel. Go right ahead. And if there's anything you're going to want to put on the uh, overhead, I can switch it over if you need to. Thank you. You're welcome. You may proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank all of you for all the hard work and uh, for sticking with us here today. We're almost at the 5 o'clock hour. Um, so I want to start my closing argument by addressing Mr. Stone's arguments in reference to these aggravators. Um, with regards to the prior violent felony mid, uh, uh, where the instruction clearly shows that you can use violent acts that are committed during a single criminal episode, I, the case law says that he can make that argument. But ladies and gentlemen, it just, it seems like Mr. Son is sitting here arguing the enormity of this horrible thing that happened, and believe me, it was a horrible thing that happened. It was. And he wants to use all three of those murders as a justification for y'all to enter the death penalty. But he also wants you to count them as separate and apart. It seems as if the state is wanting to get eat its cake Wanting two bites at the apple is basically what they're looking for. Now, when it comes to the cold, calculated, and premeditated aggravator, I don't believe I heard Dr. Carpenter say one time that what Mr. Amato stands convicted of doing is something that a normal person would do. The whole purpose of Dr. Carpenter's testimony was to try and provide you with the information that says Grant Amato will make a fine adjustment to the structure of a life sentence in prison. That is the only reason that Dr. Carpenter testified here today. He did not testify about him being a normal person. All of the factors associated with the lack of a prior criminal history, um, the, 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 the no early crimes of violence or any, all of those things, all of those were factors that go, that went into his professional opinion that if you decide Mr. Amato should serve the rest of his life in prison without ever coming out, that he would be able to do it and that Within that structure of prison, within the structure of prison, based on his time at the Seminole County Jail, he will not present a risk of danger to either inmates or staff. That's all that was. I'm not trying to make it anything more than that. Now, with this cold, calculated, and premeditated aggravator, Remember, the state's evidence of a timeline is all theoretical. I mean, the murder was committed by a gun that's represented by a picture. Their, their theory that, that Miss Amato was shot at 4.44 p.m. is based on the premise that she was not using her computer anymore and was sitting at her computer desk. I'm not going to sit here and belabor the conflicts that existed in that evidence. I told all of you that we respect the verdict in your case, and I'm not going to go back and rehash it. I will let you draw your own conclusions. Now. I want to talk about the individual aspect 
of what you were all about to go do after you get the final instructions from Judge Rex Siegler. No juror is ever required to vote for death. Not in this case, not even in the worst case you can imagine. Mitigation is any reason to choose life or to not choose death. The mitigation that we're presenting to you today, Mr. Stone went over our list that will be going back with you briefly. It's just a list. How much weight you assign to it is totally up to you. But mitigation, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, we're not coming in here and saying that mitigation is in any way, shape, or form an excuse for what happened. It is merely to assist you in coming to the right sentence. It certainly doesn't have to be connected in any way to this crime. <coughs> mitigation comes from each of your own individual backgrounds, experiences, and yes, your most importantly, your sense of mercy. All of us have it. How much you decide you want to apply to this particular case is up to you. You know, you can even come up with your own reasons for choosing life. Nobody says it has to come from this list or that list. You all come in here as unique individuals being charged with a, a very weighty decision. And you know, something can be mitigating and you, you can't even put it into words. It's just a feeling that you have. It doesn't have to be something specific. It's based on your own life experience. Each juror can give the weight of life to any one mitigating factor, including mercy. <clears throat> you get, you alone as individuals get to assign the weight or significance to any mitigating circumstance. And something that's very important, it, it doesn't have to be unanimous, unanimous. Remember I told you Unanimity was something that only applied in the guilt phase. It does not apply in a penalty phase. And you know what? You can use whatever mitigating circumstance leads you to vote for life, even if the rest of the jurors disagree with you. This is not about peer pressure here, ladies and gentlemen. This is about coming to your own decision. You can certainly find that one mitigating circumstance from the 16 that we'll be providing you outweighs the aggravating circumstances raised by the state. This is an individualized moral decision, not a group factual decision. The group factual decision happened in the guilt phase. Not in this one, not in the penalty phase. One juror may feel very strongly that life is appropriate and another juror may disagree with that person. It's perfectly okay. Does it mean that you're right and he's wrong or, or he's right and you're wrong? Remember what I told you in my opening statements. If it's your decision, it's the right decision, whether you agree or disagree with another juror or not. And the other thing is, no one has to justify, explain, or to put into reason, words their reason for his or her vote. However you vote, that's your vote. Nobody's going to tell you 
why you're wrong or why you're right. Because if they're doing that, then they're not following the instructions when it comes to how jurors should conduct themselves in that room. All of you have spent a lot of time together over the last month. You need to treat each other with respect. And you know, it's not really appropriate to demand that somebody believe the way you believe. Which brings me to my next point. Every juror has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. No juror should ever be coerced, intimidated, or treated unprofessionally. You ladies and gentlemen have conducted yourselves professionally throughout this entire trial. Now it's not time to stop. Every one of you sitting here today is qualified to sit on this jury. Every one of you is a valued member of this jury. In this country, we respect the rights of people to have their own value system, and we don't try and impose our values on others. So when you go back in to deliberate, please be respectful of each other. One vote <clears throat> for a life sentence without the possibility of parole is not a hung jury. There's no such thing as a hung jury in a penalty phase. It just can't happen. That only happens in the guilt phase, where you couldn't come to a unanimous verdict, where somebody is holding out and will not make up their mind and will not agree with the majority of the jurors and will not change their vote no matter how long you deliberate. And that's when a mistrial is declared and the whole process starts over. We're way past that point now. Life in prison without the possibility of parole means exactly what it says. Grant Amato will die in prison. He will never get out. He will never qualify for parole. He'll never qualify for work release. You heard Dr. Carpenter talk about he'll start out in a maximum security prison until they've determined at what level prison that he can be reassigned to. Ladies and gentlemen, people that are convicted of murder, premeditated, they don't get they don't get minimum security prisons. Now, if you vote for life, remember, you're not going to be hanging up the jury. You're not going to be taking the vote hostage. You're not going to be a holdout. You're voting your own specific way. A non-unanimous vote on punishment is legitimate and lawful, just like I told you. If one juror votes one way and one juror votes the other way, they're both right. Nobody's wrong. Each juror has a legal duty to get his or her decision onto the verdict form and into court. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the law says you must not sacrifice your individual moral judgment and decisions just for the sake of agreeing with other jurors because you're outnumbered, okay? You have the right 
the duty and the obligation to stick by your decision, even if the majority of voters, I mean jurors, is against you. Do you remember, do you remember in Vore Dyer, just about every one of the individual Vore Dyer questions, Mr. Dowdy asked you, if it comes down to it, and you want to vote life, and nobody is agreeing with you, will you knock on that door and say, hey, I'm done. I've carefully considered, and I'm done. Let me out. I vote for life. That's it. It's done. It's over. Finally, number 10, the law is always satisfied with a life vote and is never satisfied with a coerced vote. You stand your ground. If a final vote includes a life vote, you have successfully discharged your duties as a jury. That means the process has worked. Now, the mitigators, the judge is going to be giving you a list of the mitigators that we are going to be sending back with you. Now, there are 16 of them on the list. The first two are statutory mitigators, no significant history of prior criminal activity. Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I have a list of 16 mitigators. I guess I'm going to ask you all to write them down so that you can remember them and assign them the weight that you would like to do that. The first mitigator is no significant history of prior criminal activity. That applies to Grant Amato's history before his arrest for the charges and the crimes in this case. Now, Mr. Stone wants to make a crime out of the fact that Grant Amato took money from his family, which if anyone in his family had decided to press charges against him, had signed a sworn criminal complaint against him, had provided it to law enforcement, charges had been filed, I might agree with them, but the Amato family had gotten past all of that. They were trying to work with Grant Amato about that money. Remember, it was discovered long before these murders occurred. <clears throat> so I'm not seeing it as far as prior criminal history goes there. The other one is the fact that he was arrested in reference to this propofol. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard and you will be taking back the no information that was filed by the Orange County State Attorney's Office, which states, I quote, from the investigation which has been made, it is the opinion of the writer, Catherine A. Marlowe, Assistant State Attorney, that this case is not suitable for prosecution. I don't care if he was arrested or not. The state decided not to file charges. So until his arrest in this case, he had no prior criminal history. And I believe we've proven that mitigator by the greater weight of the evidence. Now, the mitigator that Grant Amato was 29 years of age at the time of his crime, the reason I believe that's significant is because Dr. Carpenter told you the significance, that being Grant Amato's ability to go into the structure of a prison setting without causing any problems. That's the significance 
That's the significance of that. Well, thank you. Get some help here. <clears throat> Lack of uh, prior criminal convictions. Before this case, Grant Amato had no prior criminal convictions. Y'all can probably write this faster than I can say it. Grant Amato had no history of violent behavior. Those would be reflected in the school records here that you'll be taking back with you to the jury room. If you look at his school history records, at least elementary, high school, there's no, no behavioral problems there. And in, during the period that Mr. Amato has been in the Seminole County Jail, he's had no disciplinary reports. Lieutenant Gatsy, he testified to that. That one's established by the greater weight of the evidence. And that he has the ability to adjust to structure. He has certainly shown that since for the very first time in his life he spent over seven months in a county jail. He's been a model prisoner. No disciplinary reports. Has no history of substance abuse or alcohol abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that those who are charged with supervising people in the medical profession take it very seriously. We don't want people who are providing medical care for us to be impaired in any way or even there be a suspicion of it. My question to Dr. Carpenter, I asked him if he was familiar with the Physicians Recovery Network or PRN, which is that, which is that administrative body charged with overseeing individuals if there is even a suspicion so that had Grant Amato not committed these crimes and had Grant Amato gotten that job with Express Scripts, there's probably the possibility that his critical care registered nurse license would have been under PRN supervision for a period of time. Remember, there was a battery of toxicology tests taken to determine if there was any drugs whatsoever in Mr. Amato's system. The only thing that was there was an ETG, a metabolite, which basically indicates that at some point in time in the last day or two, or as Dr. Carpenter testified, that he had a beer with dinner the night before. Certainly no indication of, of alcohol abuse or anything like that. He has no DUIs. He has none of that. There's no identifiable mental illness or history of psychiatric treatment. True. Has no history of brain injury or neurological impairment. Also true. Does not have an antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy. Dr. Carpenter testified that those things are true and it's unrefuted. Grand Amato has no history of behavioral disruption in school records. There they are. You can see them yourselves. Grand Amato's bachelor's degree is in nursing, meaning that from whenever he decided what he wanted to become when he went to college, Grand Amato cared about caring for people. That was what his chosen profession was, and by all accounts, from the testimony of Jessica Bean, he did a very good job. Or as Dr. Carpenter stated, he's a caregiver. Grant Amato's good capacity for social relations in the community. <clears throat> Cody and Grant were part of a circle of friends. They'd been friends ever since they were in high school, all the way up to this point in time years and years later. So Grant Amato has demonstrated his ability to exist within a social circle. And then number 15, of course, related right to Dr. Carpenter's testimony and evidence, base rates of violence in prison are favorable to Grant Amato. You saw 
what those graphs showed you from the age of 30, how any potential problems go all the way down to nothing. And he's on that downward slope as we sit here today. And then again, number 16, any other mitigation that I haven't specified to you. Okay, so what are we doing? At the time that Grant Amato committed these crimes for which he stands before you today, he had been on this earth a total of 362 months, which is 29 plus born on March of 1989 comes 362 months total that he'd been alive on this earth. What we're all here about is a six month time frame. A six month time frame from July 2018 when this relationship with Sylvie began. The one that Mr. Stone by his own words indicates to all of you, I don't know what you believe, but what Mr. Stone believes was an obsession, an addiction, something that consumed him, something that caused him to kill his family, this obsession, this addiction. We're talking six months out of 362 you know what that comes to? That comes to 1.68% of his life. We're here deciding life or death based on a time period of 1.68% of his life, less than 2%. As far as the other 98%, mitigating factors, we're asking you to consider Grant's life. Here's the question. Grant Amato is either going to die by God's hand or the governor's hand. How he dies is determined by your own individual moral decisions. Please consider the 98%. I'm not even going to read these to you. You can read them yourselves. He was born a good Catholic boy. He was baptized on September 10th got his first communion in April. And as you can see, all of his grades are wonderful. All of his citizenship is wonderful. He was a Boy Scout. He was an outstanding student at Timber Creek High School. member of the National Society of High School Scholars. Each of those sentences there, self-motivated, loyal, and dependable, never a discipline problem, a particular affinity for science. All of those came from letters that were written to the University of Central Florida from his teachers and guidance counselors. Wrong way. Those are the letters from which those quotes are taken. This is a personal statement. It's contained in the UCF records where Grant was asked to write a personal statement as to why he wanted to attend UCF. And in it, one of the statements that he says, 
because this is back in 2000, 10, 2011. The most influential person in my life is my father. Although my family supplies much of the unconditional love and understanding, it is certainly my father who taught by example how to set and reach goals. <clears throat> Remember, ladies and gentlemen, I told you that uh, I'm not presenting this mitigation as an excuse. I'm trying to provide you with a glimpse into Grant Amato's life before the terrible tragedy that struck his family. He admired and loved his dad. He adored his mom. And of course, he was part of this circle of friends. There was a time when Blake Turpin and Jericho Fine, they were all part of the same circle of friends. That's them having dinner together. And that's them when they were part of an airsoft team. Grant and Cody were always inseparable. Grant was a good friend to all of these people until this tragedy. But his best friend was Cody. Jason loves Grant. Grant loves Jason. Do you remember the scene from the interview? Gentlemen, I offer no explanation, excuse, or anything else for what Grant Amato stands here accused of, convicted of, facing life or death. But just remember, that all happened in 1.68% of his life. I ask you to consider the mitigators that I presented to you today. I ask you to consider the 98% of Grant Amato's life where he was a good person, a good boy, a good son, a good brother. I also ask each of you to remember that now is the time for each of you to make your own individual moral decision about what is best. I believe everything that's been presented here screams out for a life sentence. 
I ask you to return one. Thank you.